Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Well, excellent. This afternoon, we're going to look a little bit about maintaining memory and focus. And so it doesn't matter what age you are, whether you're 30, 50, or 80, cognition is something that is so, so, so important. So we're going to give you four tips to maintain memory. Two are a little more complicated, so we'll spend more time on those. And two of them are very simple. So let's start with the simple ones. Please take notes, because when you write things down, it's part of how you maintain memory. When you do write them down, though, you do need to look at them for eight seconds. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're 50, 30, or 90, the body requires eight seconds for you to look at something before it goes into your permanent memory bank. So sometimes we just go too fast. I would love to take questions in the middle of the seminar. I will repeat the questions so you all can hear them. And I assure you that even though I'm pushing 60, I will not forget where we are in the seminar. Okay? I will come back and we'll keep it very organized for you. So tip number one to maintain memory and focus is to avoid aspartame. Aspartame is NutraSweet. There are now hundreds of medical trials on aspartame. In fact, there are many different side effects to aspartame. But when it comes to memory, when aspartame breaks down in the body, one of its byproducts is something called formaldehyde. How many of you have heard of formaldehyde? Most of you, right? That's what we use to embalm you. So we don't want your brain breaking down products, okay, and the rest of your body breaking down products into formaldehyde. If you do an autopsy on someone with Alzheimer's disease, they have a very characteristic yellow plaque. The only other thing that we know of that causes this yellow placking is aspartame use. In fact, 80% of the complaints to the Food and Drug Administration on non-prescription items recently have been on aspartame use. There's many, many other sweeteners now that are more desirous. Probably the best sweetener is stevia, S-T-E-V-I-A. It's now very readily available. It's made from a plant, does not have any side effects. We know does not affect cognition. So tip number one is really pretty simple. Try and avoid aspartame use. Any questions on tip number one? That was easy, right? Everybody remember that? OK, good. Tip number two is to exercise. How many of you like to exercise? If you like to exercise, raise your hand. Oh, you guys are so good. That's so much better than me. I hate it. I do. I hate exercise. Probably some of you do too. The thing about exercising is I honestly exercise for one reason. It's not weight control. It is to maintain memory. I had the privilege of meeting Jack LaLanne before he passed. And I had one question for Jack. I said, can you give me a cue on exercise? I mean, how do you learn to like it? I was surprised by his answer. He said, I hate it. I go, you're kidding. He goes, no, but I love the results. And that's the idea. So yes, it does help you maintain really good weight. And of course, that's very important. Dr. Houston looked at some of that with you. But it also helps you maintain memory. And when it comes to exercises, you should do two kinds. Some are memory exercises, like crossword puzzles, etc. A good one that you can do, and I gave you a handout of different exercises. One on here is to wear your watch on the opposite hand and turn it upside down. That really helps getting your brain going. Someone asked me a break. Do I still not put cell phone numbers in my phone? I don't. If I pull up my cell phone right now, there are no numbers in there. Because that, if I have to remember them in my brain, that helps with memory. 
I don't code in my office anything into my fax machine. I type it in, okay? Because sometimes we have all these conveniences that really do not help us maintain memory. So tip number two is to maintain memory is to do what? Exercise. Now, of course, physical exercises are really important too, okay? So what kind of physical exercises? Again, I put some on your handout. Jumping rope would be a good one that probably everybody in this room could do. A really tricky one is walking backwards a block. Watch a small child do that. It's really, really simple for a kid to walk backwards. Try it yourself. Even going 10 yards is a difficult activity. It does help maintain memory. So does moving your brain. So when kids do somersaults and stand on their head, all of that helps with cognition. So that's tip number two. Any questions on that one? Okay. Now a little bit more complicated is tip number three, and that is to be hormonally sound. Your body actually makes a hormone of memory. And of course, that one is really hard to say and it's hard to spell. It's called pregnanolone, so I'm going to spell it for you. P-R-E-G-N-E-N-O-L-O-N-E. -E -E, pregnanolone. Has anybody in this room, raise your hand if you've heard of that hormone before. Well, some of you have. Great. Where does it come from? How does your body make pregnanolone? Thank you. Excellent, sir. A, A. Your body takes cholesterol and it makes pregnanolone your hormone of memory. So if you get your total cholesterol too low, then you don't make pregnanolone. Sometimes cardiologists forget this. Of course, we want our cholesterol to be healthy. But if your total cholesterol is not at least 140, your body has a hard time making pregnanolone. So keep that part in mind. When we look at pregnanolone, it's called a mother hormone. Well, what does that mean? That means it breaks down into other hormones. So write these hormones down, or you can refer to your sheet on here. Pregnanolone makes the following hormones. Estrogen. This is in both men and women. Yes, men, you make estrogen. You're looking at me cross-eyed. Okay? Progesterone. Testosterone. And DHEA. That stands for a long chemical name, but... DHEA is something that's commonly in the literature. So let's talk about men and women both with estrogen. Men, yes, you do make estrogen. In fact, you make two kinds. If your estrogen goes too low, gentlemen, it affects your memory. If your estrogen goes too high, men, you have an increased risk in heart disease and prostate cancer. So we want to measure your estrogen. And we can do that in different fashions. We can measure it by blood. We can measure it by salivary testing, meaning spit, saliva. Or we can measure it by urine. Ladies, of course, you know you make estrogen, right? Ladies, you make three estrogens. And I'm going to go into them very briefly and I'm going to keep it simple. Are there any scientists in here? If you have a science background, then what I'm going to do is give the scientific name, and then I'm going to give an easier name so everybody understands. That way we'll cover everybody. Is that good? Okay. E1, everybody can write that down, because if you went to look at E1 in a textbook or online, you could still find out what that is. For the scientist, it's estrone. E-S-T-R-O-N-E. It comes from the Latin derivation 1, hence E1, okay? E2, estradiol, E-S-T-R-A-D-I-O-L, di for 2. 
And then, of course, you've probably figured out by now, E3-estriol, E-S-T-R-I-O-L, try for three. Now, why is this important? For women, estrogen literally is 400 functions, 400. It's taste, touch, smell, hearing, skin tone. Estrogen lowers cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure. It is memory for a woman, literally equals memory. In fact, estrogen for women even helps vision because, ladies, you have estrogen receptors everywhere in your body, including your eyes. But it does matter what kind of estrogen. The E1 estrogen, most scientists believe, is linked to breast cancer. So we don't want to replace that one as we age. Everybody understand that? OK. The E2 estrogen is basically the 400 functions in the body. So as women become menopausal, et cetera, if estrogen is low, we like to replace a little bit of the E2 so you maintain memory, lower cholesterol, blood sugar, et cetera. Everybody with me so far? Then there's the E3. Most scientists believe this one helps ladies prevent breast cancer. Prevent. It's a weak estrogen. It's 80 times weaker E3 is than E2, but it's a very important estrogen. So as women age, we look now at replacing E2 and E3. When we give women estrogen, we do put it on the skin. That's called transdermal. We don't give it by mouth because there's an increased risk in clotting. Estrogen by mouth is very, very hard on the liver. It can cause gallstones. And if we give estrogen by mouth, it lowers growth hormone, the hormone that keeps you younger. So do women need estrogen? To maintain memory, they do. Not all women lose estrogen as they age. And that's the reason why we have to measure. I have three women in my practice that are pushing 80 that still have the same amount of estrogen at almost 80 as they did when they're 35. So if I gave them estrogen, that would be bad. Okay, That's part of how we increase the risk of breast cancer. So we have to measure. The second one I mentioned, progesterone. Gentlemen, you make it. We don't know a lot about it in men. It may help prevent prostate cancer. It does help your nerve endings. But ladies, progesterone for you helps with sleep. It helps with anxiety, irritability, mood swings, depression. As women age, progesterone tends to go down. It can even be low when women are younger. That's usually part of postpartum depression. That can also be part of progesterone being low of PMS. A lot of studies now with progesterone, because if you have a stroke and you go into a major medical center like you have here in San Francisco, you have great hospitals here. If you go into the ER, what ends up happening is if you've had the stroke in the last 8 to 12 hours, they give you IV progesterone, male or female, because that protects your nerve endings in your brain and the rest of your body. So very important to see what that hormone is doing, too. Remember, estrogen and progesterone come from pregnanolone, okay? How about testosterone? Ladies, let's start with you first. You do make testosterone. It's important that women have normal testosterone for a sense of well-being, strength of bone, but also testosterone helps with memory for women. Not as much as it does for men. For men, yes, testosterone sexual interest, and yes, testosterone for males lowers cholesterol, blood sugar, and blood pressure. But very importantly, Testosterone for men equals memory. Testosterone for men is also bone structure. 
because men get osteoporosis, bone loss, just like women do. In fact, gentlemen, if you're 55 or over and you've not had a bone density test, you should have one done. Because honestly, it comes down to three things in life. Vision, memory, and mobility. And bone loss has to be as part of that mobility part. So do we replace testosterone in men? We do. There are several ways of doing it. The most common is to put it on the skin. Of course, we measure levels of all of these before we replace them. If women have had breast cancer or men have had prostate cancer, there's different cases where they may or may not be able to use hormones. So that's a separate case. Then I mentioned DHEA. DHEA makes estrogen and testosterone in both men and women, but it also balances the stress hormone cortisol. Now cortisol, if it's not normal, and Dr. Houston talked a little bit about this, it does what to cholesterol? It drives it up, right? If it's not normal, then stress will drive up blood sugar, blood pressure, put weight around your middle, but it also affects your memory. No matter what age you are, whether you're a college student, whether you're 50 or 90, if you're stressed, your memory is not as sharp. And the reason that happens is, remember we said pregnanolone was a mother hormone, right? If you're really stressed, the body at any age takes pregnanolone and it makes cortisol. And the reason it does that is you have to have cortisol, your stress hormone, to live. If you don't have cortisol, you die in seven days. So your body will preferentially make your stress hormone cortisol. A small amount of stress helps maintain memory. What we don't want it to be is distress. You have to kind of mitigate stress. Is there, is there anybody in here who's not stressed? Raise your hand if you're not stressed. A couple of people, it would be interesting to measure your stress hormone cortisol. The best way to measure that, if we're not looking at a disease like Addison's or Cushing's, the best way to measure cortisol, your stress hormone, is to do a saliva test. And you actually do that at home, and you send it in. If cortisol, if you don't mitigate that stress and cortisol stays high, obviously memory is not as sharp. So let me give you an example of mitigating stress. I do travel a lot, and Delta Airlines is very, very kind to me. Like most airlines, if you're a frequent flyer, occasionally you get bumped up to first class, right? So one night I was sitting in seat 2C in the first class section, and a lot of times I wear dark colors, particularly black. Black kind of hides all sins, you know? But I like dark colors. And I had a white blouse on. The gentleman in the seat just ahead of me wanted a glass of red wine. Yes. The stewardess was opening up the glass of red wine, or the bottle. She uncorked it. She just started to pour. We hit an air pocket, and literally the entire bottle of red wine went all over me. All over me. I laughed. I did. I laughed. Is it worth a white blouse for my memory not to be as sharp? My cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure go up? No, it's not, right? So you kind of have to mitigate stress by looking at, is it worth it? In fact, scientists have studied what causes stress, and it doesn't matter what culture you live in, what race you are, the number one stressor in the entire world to someone is if your child dies before you. Short of that, those of you who've lived long enough in this room, don't most things kind of come back around again? Yeah, they do. If you kind of understand that as you age, things that have really sometimes distressed you terribly, they do come back around. So mitigating stress is important. When we look at the hormones, there's two others I want to comment on. One is thyroid. Your thyroid regulates everything that occurs in your entire body, all of it. Whether your memory's sharp or not, whether you can lose weight or not, whether your cholesterol's high or not, 
all of those are governed by thyroid. And your thyroid gland sits right here in your neck. If it's not functioning perfect, you notice I didn't say normal, right? If it's not optimal, then your memory is not as sharp. So go home and look at your lab work, okay? You're going to see something on there called TSH. T S H. And that stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. You don't have to know that. It just says TSH. That's the hormone that stimulates your thyroid to work. If that hormone is above two, your memory is not as sharp. Now, when you go home, you're going to say, oh, that lab says normal's up to 5.5. But remember, if TSH is 4, your memory's not going to be as rapid fire. So in a metabolic medicine approach that we're looking at here, in an anti-aging approach, what we want to have is optimal function of everything, and that includes your thyroid. Well, low, it will depend on your lab, but most, the lower limit of normal is 0 0.35. If it's lower than what it should be, that's not good either. That would be called hyperthyroidism, meaning your thyroid is overactive. Okay? So we don't want it too high or too low. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's kind of the reverse of what you think, so I'm going to re-explain her question. Okay? When your body makes thyroid, it makes two kinds of thyroid, T3 and T4. It also makes that TSH, thyroid-stimulating hormone. The TSH is not the thyroid hormone. So if it's too low, it would be overstimulating your thyroid. That's bad. If it's too high, it's under-stimulating your thyroid. That's not good either. Okay? That T3 and T4 I talked about, the T3 and T4 are both important. When it comes to memory and lowering cholesterol, the T3 is the most important. If you're taking thyroid medicine and you're taking something like levothyroxine or Synthroid, that would be T4. Two medical trials have shown that 98% of people that need thyroid medicine do best if they take both T4 and T3. Because again, T3, weight loss, T3 lowers cholesterol better, T3 helps prevent heart disease, helps with cognition. 2% of people do fine on any of them. So it's about optimal function. Other questions? Free T3 will depend on your lab, as will free T4. What you want to see it is about dead center of normal or slightly above that. So you can look on your labs at home. Somewhere around 3.2 would be dead center for most labs of a free T3. Yes, sir. If you have nodules and antibodies, particularly if you have antibodies, the very recent studies, does everybody know what an antibody is? Okay. Who does not? Do you want me to explain it? Okay. When your body has a reaction, sometimes it produces something called antibodies. And what that is, is antibodies are produced to take care of the problem that occurred. So if you have high antibodies, this is what's called an autoimmune process. Your body's literally attacking itself. So if you have high antibodies and your thyroid function is low, that's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If you have high antibodies and your thyroid function is too high, that's called Graves' disease. If you have positive antibodies, particularly Hashimoto's low thyroid function, the newest studies are showing you should avoid gluten. Okay. If you avoid gluten, which is wheat, then you'll see a lot of times, not all the time, but you'll see that the antibodies come down. Also, having a very healthy gut is important. 
when it comes to your immune system. If you have reflux, IBS, you have GERD, you have diarrhea, constipation, you're not healthy. 70%, 70% of your immune system is in your GI tract, your gut. So if you have some of those symptoms, we want to help fix that. How many of you have heard of serotonin, the happy neurotransmitter? You see that on TV, et cetera, right? Guess where serotonin is made? 90% of it is made in your GI tract, your gut. So if your gut's not healthy, it's hard to make serotonin. Dr. Houston mentioned vitamin K. Vitamin K is made in your gut. So the gastrointestinal tract is really, really important as an organ of detox, but particularly for autoimmune diseases. Okay? That leaves us with insulin. Now, most of you know what insulin is, right? It's the hormone that regulates your blood sugar. You can measure insulin. That's not what you have at home, probably, that says FBS. That FBS on your lab is fasting blood sugar. And you just heard Dr. Houston say that should be 80, right? It should be. Anytime the FBS is above 90, you're going down the wrong road. I mean, think about it. Why? We can sit there and look at your labs for 10 years and watch your blood sugar climb. Why don't we just do something before you get diabetes instead of waiting until you have the disease? We can also measure your insulin, the hormone itself, and we do that fasting, meaning you haven't eaten for 10 hours. And some of you have had something called a hemoglobin A1C measured. That's your blood sugar over the last you know, three months average. Okay? If your fasting insulin is 6, that's perfect. That's what you want it to be. If it's above 12 to 15, that may still be normal, but again, your body's going down the wrong road. The reason I'm mentioning that is diabetes is now called type 3 Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to say that again because it's really important. Diabetes is now called type 3 Alzheimer's disease. So it does matter where your blood sugar sits when it comes to your memory. It's hugely very, very, very important. So we want that fasting blood sugar to be 80 to 90. We want to look at that fasting insulin. Perfect, again, would be 6. For those of you who've had a hemoglobin A1C done, I saw some of you nod, there's new norms, okay? If you go to your doctor now, you'll see that it, before you had a hemoglobin A1C that was six, that was normal, it's not now. Almost every lab in the country, the upper limit of normal now for hemoglobin A1C is 5.7. So we're starting to look at tighter control of what happens with insulin with heart disease, we're looking at it also in relationship to memory. Questions? Is there any of that you want me to go back over? No? Okay, so everybody's got tip number three, right? Tip number three is to be hormonally sound. And we learned about pregnanolone, our hormone of memory. We learned that it's a mother hormone and it makes estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA, right? But it also makes cortisol our stress hormone. Yes? Different kinds of herbal therapies, because our question is on herbal therapies and hormones. For example, for women, you mentioned black cohosh. Black cohosh, dong quai, chase berry, can help balance if there's a slight imbalance, but they're really not hormone replacement. Okay? Her question is, if you don't have enough pregnanolone, can you replace that? You would replace pregnanolone. And in the United States, unfortunately, you can get pregnanolone without a prescription. Please don't buy it. Because it makes estrogen, right? It makes testosterone, right? 
I didn't say ladies, but if you have high testosterone, you have an increased risk in diabetes and heart disease. Okay? So we don't want people taking pregnanolone unless you see a metabolic anti-aging specialist and have it measured, because then you can make hormones you don't need also. Okay? So it's always best to have it measured and have a physician or other healthcare practitioner guide you in your road here. Okay? It's a great question. All these are great questions. Yes, ma'am. DHEA is also available without a prescription, and again, because DHEA makes estrogen and testosterone, we are one of the only countries in the world you can get it without a prescription. Honestly, you should see a physician. For example, you can't go to Canada and get DHEA, okay? You can't get pregnant alone without a prescription. Here, we it should honestly be a prescription so that patients don't take things they don't need. If you take DHEA and you don't need it, there is an increased risk in cancer. Studies have shown that. If you don't take DHEA and you need it, then you can get other diseases. It, it's about balance. In fact, if I could sum everything up, I would just say it's honestly about balance. Yes, sir. Seven keto DHEA would be something that usually a man should not take. Okay? There would not be a reason to. The seven keto is a group, a chemical group, that it just put on the hormone DHEA. The reason 7-keto is put on there so it does not make testosterone. And if a woman has normal testosterone or high, then we would give her the 7-keto. But for males, there's probably not a reason to do that. Okay? Prostate cancer, we're not sure about. So I'm going to leave that separately if you've had a history of prostate cancer. But otherwise, we give men DHEA and not 7-keto. Okay? Yes, sir. On a blood test, if you're looking at DHEA, you want a dead center of what the normal is or slightly above. There's kind of a wide variance in that particular hormone. What you're getting on a blood test should be called DHEAS, which is the free hormone, okay? And I honestly can't answer that for you because I don't do blood testing of hormones. I do all my testing by salivary testing or urine. And the reason that I do that is when you do blood testing, you only see what's going on in the blood. When I'm looking at salivary hormones or I'm looking at urine, then I see the hormones throughout your entire body. So I probably haven't gotten a serum DHEA in 15 years. Okay? Because I've been doing, I was an ER doc for 20 years and then I've been practicing this medicine for 15. So, yeah. Sir, you had a question. You had your hand up several times. Oh, that's such a great question, and I'm going to segue that into tip number four. So thank you, sir. His question was, if your fasting blood sugar is 100, how can you really move that down? How much, how successful can you be? Tip number four is to be nutritionally sound. So let's look at some nutrients. You have a list sitting in front of you that help maintain memory but there's one on here called alpha-lipoic acid. Does everybody see it? It's the second one down. Alpha-lipoic acid at 100 milligrams helps you maintain memory. Starting at about the age of 50, you make less. So almost everybody would benefit from 100 milligrams of alpha-lipoic acid if you're 50 or above. If you vigorously exercise, you get deplete in this very important nutrient as well. So even if you're in this room and you're 30 and you're marathoning, you're probably deplete in alpha-lipoic acid. Your question was about blood sugar. At a higher dose, alpha-lipoic acid at 3 to 400 milligrams is very effective to help lower blood sugar. Also, alpha-lipoic acid is wonderful to protect your liver. It's a very great herb to do that. You don't want to take 600 milligrams or more on your own without a doctor's advice because too much lipoic acid or higher doses can make your thyroid not work. Okay? I'm going to come to our lipoic in just a second. That's another great question. You cannot eat your way 
into lipoic acid. Of course, we want you to, to eat as much as you can through good food, right? But pretty much lipoic acid is only in spinach. It takes seven pounds of spinach to make one milligram. You, you heard me say the starting dose was 100. So this is one you would have to take as a supplement. This question on our lipoic acid, it's a, a different kind of lipoic acid, the racemic form. That form is probably more bioavailable, meaning it gets into your body and does what it's supposed to do. But if you're really, really healthy, most people do fine with alpha lipoic acid as it is. If you've had heart disease, congestive heart failure, you're an athlete, then our lipoic acid might be a better form for you to take. Okay? You're welcome. Yes? Acid reflux. Uh, no, none of the nutrients that we're looking at here would affect acid reflux from a negative viewpoint. Okay? It's another good question. How many of you have a problem when you take fish oil? You burp it up. Some of you? If you burp it up, one of two things is going on. Either you're not taking a pharmaceutical grade substance, or your gut's not healthy. One way of fixing that is to take the fish oil and put it in the freezer and take it frozen. And then you won't burp it back up. When you take nutrients, we do want you to take what's called pharmaceutical grade. And the reason for that is that nutrients come in four grades, three are for humans. Pharmaceutical grade means it gets into your body and does what it's supposed to do. What else does pharmaceutical grade mean? Who knows? It's exactly. Pharmaceutical grade also means that it's guaranteed to be 100% pure with outside verification by another company. So wherever you're purchasing your vitamins, always make sure that you're getting what's called pharmaceutical grade. If they don't know what that is, then you need to ask or look at where you're purchasing your vitamins. That's particularly true of one of the nutrients on here called coenzyme Q10. If you're not purchasing pharmacy grade Q10, you need four times the amount. Because it would take, your body does not absorb it as well. Coenzyme Q10 is one of the fueling sources in your body. So is lipoic acid. Your body literally has little engines. Those are called mitochondria. And the mitochondria in your body need fuel. And again, starting at about the age of 50, the fueling sources decline. Coenzyme Q10 is one of those. CoQ10 is about a third of the fueling source for your brain and for the rest of your body. You cannot eat your way really into Q10. So if you're 50, 100 milligrams of a very high quality Q10 would be a good place to start. If you marathon, and I see professional athletes in my practice, you really honestly need three to 400 milligrams a day of Q10. There's other ways you get deplete. For those of you taking a statin drug, Mevacor, Zocor, Lipitor, Prevacol, Vicor, and Crestor, okay, they're all great drugs to lower cholesterol, but they deplete your body of coenzyme Q10. And so you need to take Q10, otherwise your fueling source is not as good. And it's part of the reason a study came out recently on statin drugs can cause memory decline. Well, what would happen? If you don't have fueling source, the memory isn't there, right? So for each drug that you're on, a good guideline is you need 100 milligrams of Q10 if your body gets depleted. And there's four classes of drugs that cause depletion. The statin drugs that lower cholesterol. Those of you who are taking hydrochlorothiazide, which is a diuretic water pill, that depletes the body of Q10. Those of you who are on a beta blocker, okay, that's something that ends in OL like a tenolol. 
because you've had high blood pressure, heart racing, heart attack, depletes the body of Q10. And most of the medicines you take by mouth to lower your blood sugars deplete the body of Q10, like metformin, liburide, glipizide. So let's say you had a heart attack and you're 55. <laughs> and you're taking all four of those medicines, because you might be if you've had a heart attack. You would need 100 milligrams of Q10 because you're 55. You would need 400 more milligrams of Q10 because of each drug is 100 for a total of 500. We can measure Q10 levels. So that is a blood study. It's something that can be done at a very few select labs, but you can have your blood work drawn anywhere, and it can be sent to those select labs. Yes. Ubiquinol would be like our lipoic acid. Ubiquinol would be a better form of coenzyme Q10. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's come back to DHEA because really, if you're only going to take one nutrient, let's just say you hate pills, you hate liquids, you refuse to do any of this. If you're going to take one, hands down, and I think Dr. Houston would agree with this, it would be omega-3 fatty acids, okay, fish oil, okay? If you're only going to take one thing, rather than, you know, it's important to eat your way into it as much as you can, remember that fish can have mercury in it. So you have to make sure that you purchase your fish way out someplace like Alaska. Also, if you have farm-raised fish, it does not have omega-3s. Farm-raised fish eat grain. In order for that fish to have omega-3s in it, okay, it has to feed off of baby fish and plankton, etc., to make the omega-3s. Other foods, like you mentioned walnuts, most different nutrients or most different nuts will have omega-3s in them. Lamb is very, very, very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Lamb is, people either like lamb or they don't. I eat it at least once a week. It is like the perfect meat. Not only is it high in omega-3s and you don't have to worry about mercury, but lamb also is high in carnitine, a nutrient I'm gonna talk about in a minute, and it is the most easily digested meat there is. So it's easier on the gut. Yes. I'm going to come to sardines in a minute. Okay, I have a special special section for sardines. Okay. Other things like avocados. In one of my books, what you must know about vitamins, minerals, herbs, and more. In there is all these different kinds of nutrients. In there also is what foods they're in, and then in the back of the book, it will list things like high blood pressure, heart disease, athlete pre-surgery, et cetera, and different states where nutrients might be good. So the references to all of this are in, in that book, what you must know about vitamins, minerals, herbs, and more. You can overtake anything, okay? The biggest side effect of higher doses of Q10 is diarrhea. At 4,000 milligrams and above, fish oil does become a mild blood thinner. So if you're on Plavix, if you're on Coumadin or other blood thinners, then you have to be careful with how much fish oil you take. If you're taking 4,000 milligrams or above, you should be under the direction of a physician to do that. On here is something called phosphatidylserine. It's in the right-hand column, the third one down. You can write PS by that. Because if you're going to purchase this one, and again, you can't eat your way into this one, you can ask for PS, and the store will know what you're talking about. PS, phosphatidylserine, increases something called acetylcholine, your main neurotransmitter of memory. I love PS. It's one of the very few things that you can stand up and talk about that doesn't have any known side effects. It mixes with every medicine. Some herbs do not mix with medications. Phosphatidylserine, if you're on another medicine, it's not a problem if you take it. 
and to help with memory, PS is 300 milligrams. We also use it in adults and children for ADD, ADHD. The dosage would be different in kids. But if you weigh 100 pounds or more, then PS 300 milligrams a day. And I honestly would not be up here speaking without notes if I did not take things like PS. Okay? I love that particular nutrient. So it would be in my, when it comes to memory, it's in my top five. She asked about sardines. On here you see it says D-M-A-E. That's not D-H-E-A, this is D-M-A-E. Everybody see that? It's in the first column at the bottom there. D-M-A-E happens to be a nutrient that is great for memory, and the best source of D-M-A-E is sardines. And so the old wives' tale about eat sardines, you'll be smart and stay smart, there's something to that, okay? So that would be the DMAE. Could you take DMAE? You could. Okay, it does come as a supplement as well. Yes, ma'am. Her question is on cod liver oil. Cod liver oil is a very good source of omega-3 fatty acids, but you have to be careful. If you take too much cod liver oil, then you can have too much vitamin A and too much vitamin D, because they're both in cod liver oil. So if you need a higher dose of fish oil, okay, then a way of getting that is you could do the cod liver oil, a small amount, a teaspoon, but then you might want to also take omega-3 fatty acids if you need a higher dose. Okay? You just can get toxic if you take too much. So you don't want to take five tablespoons of cod liver oil. Okay? Yes? The question is on vitamin D. And honestly, if I had two hours to give this seminar, I would have included vitamin D. But I, it's a great question. Vitamin D, if you do not have optimal, uh, underline the word again, optimal, you have not enough vitamin D and increased risk in breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, Parkinson's, MS, diabetes, high blood pressure, back pain, polycystic ovarian disease, and memory loss. So yes, is vitamin D important? It is. If you wear sunscreen, you don't get a lot of vitamin D because most of it does not get absorbed. The darker your skin is, the less vitamin D you absorb from the sun. When it comes to your lab work, okay, everybody here in San Francisco, pretty much normal vitamin D is around 30 to 100. The vitamin D needs to be at least 55 to help prevent cancer. And the study was done by Garland, and the study was also done by Grant. Both of those people looked at that specifically. So if you have a vitamin D level of 42, is this normal? It is. Is that enough to help prevent colon, breast, and prostate cancer? Not according to Garland and Grant studies. Okay? Yes. Well, the, his question is, you know, can you get too much of, like, vitamin D? You can. You can get too much of vitamin A, D, E, and K. K, not as much as we used to think, but certainly vitamins A, D, and E. Okay? We can measure those levels. We don't have to guess. If you see a metabolic medicine specialist, we are very, very happy. Any of us, those that are fellowship trained, will measure 30 vitamins in your body, and we can tell you how much you need. In fact, when I do a vitamin program for my patients, I literally have my vitamins made for the patients many times because they literally can be made for you and you only. There's a lot of different ways to look at a nutritional program. I can't answer if vitamin A is too much for you, sir, because I would have to measure your level of vitamin A. What I can tell you is you measured 20, you said, 25,000 uh, international units, I can tell you that would be too much for a smoker. If you smoke, 
you should not take more vitamin A than 8,000 international units because there's an increase in lung cancer. Otherwise, I can't tell you without measuring, sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to put you off. I, I just can't answer that. Yes, sir. This question is on alcohol. If your doctor has advised you not to drink because you're taking a medication that alcohol is a problem with, with drinking, then if you're reading the label and it says do not drink alcohol and you're taking a medicine that says that, you should not drink any alcohol. Okay? Yes? I can't honestly answer that question for you, but what I can do is, if you look in my book, What You Must Know About Vitamins, Minerals, Herbs, and More, what it will do is it will give you in, in milligrams how much it takes to give you a certain amount of DNA, okay? <laughs> no, it would, be, it would be by weight, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, his question is on flaxseed versus fish oil. If you are very, very healthy, flaxseed is both omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Your body will take the flax and make enough omega-3s. If you're not very, very healthy, the body has a hard time making that conversion. And so for a lot of patients, we try and give omega-3s themselves because nowadays people do have a lot of stress and other things that keep us not as healthy as we could be. On here is L-carnitine. Now, there's two kinds of carnitine. One is acetyl, A-C-E-T-Y-L, which is listed here, L-carnitine. It fuels your brain. Regular L-carnitine without the acetyl group fuels the rest of your body. So carnitine is another fueling source, another about one-third. It's the first one on your list, acetyl L-carnitine. You can eat your way into some carnitine. It is pretty much only in red meat. So if you're a vegetarian or vegan, you're not getting a lot of carnitine. The highest known food, as I said, in carnitine is lamb. But the operative word is how much red meat. Size of your palm, thickness of a deck of cards. For me, this would be a five-ounce steak. It is not a 28-ounce steak. And that's where we run into problems. And most people do well two or three times a week if they just eat that much. Gentlemen, you have bigger palms. Okay? But when you go into a restaurant, you have to order a petite filet, right? Because though that's six ounces. I can't even eat a whole one of those. I have to cut a little part off if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, then you are probably not just deplete in B12, but you are deplete in carnitine, so you would need to take additional carnitine. So let's look at dosages. If you're 50, your body doesn't make as much, so at least 250 milligrams of both acetyl L-carnitine and carnitine would be a good choice. If you're a vegetarian, double that. If you're under 50, then 250 of each would be fine. That's a good place to start. If you marathon, you need more. Your brain uses carnitine. Another organ that uses a lot of carnitine is your heart. So carnitine, again, a very important fueling source. You probably can't eat your way into all of it if you're 60 because you don't want to eat that much red meat. So you do want to take it as a supplement. Those dosages are if you have normal kidney function. If your kidney function is not normal, the dosages would be less. If you eat red meat once a week, that may not be enough. Okay? So red meat twice a week for most people would be a good starting point. This is provided you have normal kidney function and you're exercising. 
We have two more nutrients before we conclude. One is ginkgo. Ginkgo is a blood thinner. So if you're on a blood thinner as a medication, do not take ginkgo. Ginkgo does increase oxygen to the brain. It does decrease inflammation. Most kinds of memory loss have an inflammatory component. So 120 to 240 milligrams a day would be a good starting dose. 120 to 240 milligrams a day. Yes, ma'am. If you're taking a daily baby aspirin, number one, see your physician because new trials have come out on baby aspirins in the last three weeks on recommendations. And if you're taking a baby aspirin only, for most people you can still take ginkgo, but it would be more in the 60 milligram to 120 milligram range. That leaves us on here with actually venpositine and B-complex. Vempositine is from the periwinkle plant. It is also a blood thinner. Studies have shown it helps maintain memory. If you have memory loss, it also helps. The dosage would be 10 milligrams twice a day. Again, if you're on a blood thinner, this may not be the best choice. It also helps with urinary incontinence, same dose. And it also helps with tinnitus, ringing in the ears, same dose in some patients. So that's venpositine from the periwinkle plant. And then lastly on here is B-complex. When you're really stressed, your body chews up Bs. So taking an extra B-complex is probably a good idea. B and C vitamins are water-soluble, so it's hard to get toxic in, in most of them. There's a couple of Bs you can get toxic in if you take too much. Let me give you a story, and it's easy to remember. About 10 years ago, a family practitioner went into a nursing home, and he put people in two groups. People in group A, everybody from memory decline. Everybody else he put in group B. People in group A, he gave them all B vitamins. Now, some needed B12 as an injection, but they all got Bs. Half went home. That's how important B vitamins are for your memory. Very, 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 very important. So we looked at a lot of nutrients that are helpful. So in review, four really great tips I think that you can take home with you and implement a lot of these even today. Tip number one is what? Tip number one, avoid aspartame, right? Tip number two, exercise, right? Tip number three, be hormonally sound. And tip number four, be nutritionally sound.